Who would win in a fight? A man holding a 16-foot pike or the guy trying to poke him with a two-foot sword? And what if it's not just one soldier, but thousands of them? On one side, a compact mass of pikemen. On the other, a looser formation of soldiers wielding short swords. These were the Hellenistic Phalanx and the Manipula Legion, arguably the most distinctive, iconic, best-trained and best-armed heavy infantry units of the ancient Mediterranean. They were fielded by the Hellenistic kingdoms and the Roman Republic in the 3rd and 2nd century BCs in their fight for supremacy of the Eastern Mediterranean. This prompted contemporary commanders and later historians to ponder the question, who rules the battlefield? The compact impenetrable phalanx with its far-reaching pikes or the far more mobile manipular legion? One battle in particular would tilt the balance in favor of one of the contenders, setting the other one on a declining slope. This was the Battle of Kinocephalae. On the 1st of May, 197 BC, a Roman legion clashed with the Macedonian army on a hill in Thessaly in Greece, known as the Dog's Head or Kinocephaly. This iconic battle was part of the Second Roman-Macedonian War. To understand how this conflict came into being, we have to go back some 20 years. In the summer of 216 BC, the Italian peninsula was being graced by the triumphal tour of a rock star general, if there ever was one in the ancient world. We're talking, of course, about Hannibal of Carthage. During the Second Punic War, the brilliant military leader crossed the Alps and thrashed the Romans in a series of engagements, the most successful one being the Battle of Cannae. On that occasion, the Carthaginians executed a perfect envelopment of the enemy, leaving between 50,000 and 75,000 Romans dead. This defeat convinced King Philip V of Macedon that those Roman upstarts were on the decline. The ambitious king, pride of the dynasty of the Antigonids and the premier power in the Greco-Hellenistic world, thus decided to ally himself with Hannibal in 215 BC. Rome was bloodied and bruised, sure, but it still had the will to fight, and she proved it by declaring war on Philip. This was the first Macedonian war fought between 214 and 205 BC. Rome's best armies and generals were busy defeating the Carthaginians, so their first war with the Antigonid king was a low-intensity affair. It mostly consisted of skirmishes and blockades conducted chiefly with the help of Rome's Greek allies, the Aetolian League. In 201 BC, Roman general Scipio defeated Hannibal, and so the war with Macedon came to an end. But Philip was dead set on creating trouble. In 200 BC, King of Egypt Ptolemy IV died, leaving the throne to the six-year-old Ptolemy V. Philip sensed an opportunity to swallow Egypt's possessions in what is today Turkey. He forged a secret pact with King Antiochus III of the Seleucid Empire, stretching from modern-day Turkey to Afghanistan. The two allies invaded the Ptolemaic territories a move which alarmed the neighboring kingdoms of Pergamon and Rhodes. These states happened to be allies of the Romans and appealed for their help. At the same time, Philip had started a war against Athens, creating Ori also amongst the Aetolian League. This was too much. The Antigonid king had tried to kick Rome when it was on the grounds, and now it was trying to gobble up much of the eastern Mediterranean. Rome issued an ultimatum to Philip to the effect of, leave our allies alone, especially in Greece. Philip's reply was essentially, oh yeah, what are you going to do? Make me? And so it was on. The Second Macedonian War broke out, and the Roman Senate appointed Consul Publius Sulpicius Galba as the commander of the expedition. Galba, however, failed to engage Philip in more than a few skirmishes, which led to his replacement with Publicus Villius Tapulus in 198 BC. His performance was equally underwhelming, and in fact, historian Plutarch criticized both generals, accusing them of being overly cautious. Tapulus even had to deal with the mutiny, Oh, in 2,000 of his legionnaires, veterans of the Second Punic War, just wanted to return home and tend to the lands. Morale amongst the legions was plummeting, and so the Roman Republic decided for a change in leadership. Out went Tapulus, and in came the man of the hour, Titus Quintesus. Flaminius. A former governor of the city of Tarentum, this energetic officer had risen to the consulship at a very young age, bypassing most of the steps required by the cursus honorum. In 198 BC, Flaminius sailed across the Adriatic towards Greece. He brought along 3,000 crack troops from Scipio's army, 20 elephants, and a thirst for glory. <laughs> 
Flaminius soon reached Tapulus and his legions and camped just eight kilometers, five miles away from Philip. The Antigonid king had stationed his army at the Aus River Gorge, modern day Albania, a strategic position which blocked the path to Macedon. The Roman consul had then sent an envoy to Philip, showing a willingness to negotiate. The Macedon monarch had by now realized that he was on the receiving end of Rome's full attention. Nothing to be happy about. Philip proposed a peace settlement, offering to withdraw from the territory conquered thus far. But Flaminius asked for more. The Macedonians should also evacuate Thessaly, a region in western Greece which was part of Macedonia since the times of Alexander the Great. This was a deliberately outrageous demand which prompted Philip to break negotiations. The king dug up his excellent defensive position at the Aus Gorge, but Flaminius could count on his local allies. A nobleman from Epirus called Carobs who acted as a guide leading some 4,300 legionnaires across little known tracks to attack the Macedonians. Macedonians from the rear. Meanwhile, the bulk of the Roman army distracted Philip with skirmishing actions and missile throwing. Philip may have been crushed then and there, but he got sight of the incoming attack on his rear and disengaged right on time. The king had saved the bulk of his army at Aus, but he had lost 2,000 men and his supply trade. As a consequence, Philip's army had to forage for food and other supplies from the land, which is a euphemism for pillaging, an act which angered Greek city-states who oh, were still sitting on the fence. On the other hand, the Roman consul Flaminius had been careful not to anger the locals with senseless plundering, a wise move which garnered him much-needed local support. Word started spreading that the Romans were not in Greece as conquerors, but as liberators against the Macedonian yoke. And this takes us to the latter part of 198 BC and the start of 197 BC. The Romans and their allies, gathered in the Aetolian and Athmanian leagues, occupied west and southwest Thessaly, leaving the northeast and the southeast to the Macedonians. Philip expected the Romans to attack in 197 BC from southwest Thessaly, and so he set up his defensive lines along the Caradag mountain range stretching from the city of Atrax to Thessaly and Thebes. This city is not to be confused with the better known Thebes in Boeotia, by the way. In preparation for the campaign, Philip had ravaged the countryside of the fertile Anipius Valley, thus depriving his enemies of sustenance. Concurrently, he had stored the plundered foodstuffs in depots at Larissa or on the Peneus River. Finally, he replenished his ranks with fresh recruits and set them to drill daily in preparation for the inevitable clash. By the end of March 197 BC, the Macedonians were fighting fit. Philip then moved his army to Larissa, where he received news that the Romans and their allies had set up camp near Thessaly and Thebes, some 60 kilometers south. This decision had been a strategic masterstroke by consul Flaminius. By doing so, he had cut Philip off from Macedonian troops garrisoned at Thessaly and Thebes itself and Demetrius further east. He had also prevented his enemy from accessing sizable food stocks accumulated in the area. Sure, Philip, as the good commander that he was, had already secured some supply depots, but as Napoleon said, an army marches on its stomach, and feeding an army that numbered 25,000 stomachs required more than just a few dolmades dipped in Tzatziki. Flaminus's moves also had secured a tactical advantage. The terrain around Thessaly and Thebes was uneven, rippling with hills and ridges, the type of terrain that can diminish or even nullify the power of a Hellenistic phalanx, but more on that later. After receiving news of the Romans' location, Philip ordered his army to march southwards. These guys clearly did not faff about, as in a single day they reached the vicinity of Ferre, just 10 kilometers north of the Roman camp. The very next morning, just before dawn, Philip resumed his march, this time sending ahead his light infantry and cavalry in a recon mission across a nearby ridge. His scouts encountered a similar formation of Aetolians dispatched by the Romans, leading to a small-scale yet fierce battle. The Antigone king thought it better to continue his march and redirected his forces towards Scotusa, 25 kilometers west, to forage for more food. There, he encamped again by the river Platanarima to ensure a fresh supply of water for his horses. Flaminius got wind of these latest movements, and he also headed west. When the Romans set to rest, they did not realize how close they were to their enemy's camp, for a crest of hills separated the two armies, a crest known to locals as the Dog's Head. That night, a heavy downpour occurred in the skies, and when the sun rose the next morning, a heavy, impenetrable fog lifted above the ground, hampering visibility and dampening sounds. According to NGL Hammond, writer for the Journal of Hellenistic Studies in 1988. It was the 1st of May, 197 BC, the date of the Battle of Kinocephaly. (laughs) 
It's now time to look at the composition of the opposing forces. According to ancient historian Livy, Philip fielded 25,000 men in total. These were 2,000 cavalrymen, 1,500 mercenaries, 4,000 light infantry, 2,000 elite guardsmen or paltasts, and the heavy infantry. 16,000 phalangites. Now, we're not going into much detail, but it's important to give at least the basics of what a Hellenistic phalanx was. This was the main formation in which Greek and Hellenistic infantry fought their battles. It basically consisted of infantrymen fighting in lines or ranks, standing shoulder to shoulder no more than one meter or three feet apart. Each rank could consist of up to a thousand men, and behind the front line stood another one and then another and so on, until a depth of sixteen ranks. Each man was protected by a light yet sturdy harass of pressed linen, a shield, helmet, and greaves. Most importantly, each phalangite was armed with a five meter or sixteen foot long pike. The first four or five ranks of the phalanx would level their pikes forward, meaning that their enemies were faced with an impenetrable forest of wooden shafts and deadly metal spikes. Phalangites drilled endlessly to learn how to march in unison, presenting a compact mass to opposing forces. A well-trained phalanx may have appeared to the poor sods facing it as a terrifying giant armored hedgehog trampling and skewering everything in its path. The phalanx, however, had its weak points. First of all, it derived its strength from speed of assembly and utmost cohesion. Uneven or sloping terrain could limit how quickly troops could assemble in ranks. Moreover, these unfavorable conditions could open gaps in the lines, allowing enemy infantry to penetrate the forest of pikes and slaughter the phalangites at close range. The other weakness was the inability to turn quickly. Taking on a phalanx head-on was tantamount to a death sentence. But what if one could attack from the flanks? The very cohesion of the formation and the unwieldy gear of the soldiers made it extremely difficult to do so something as simple as turning sideways. The Roman Republican army had learned these lessons the hard way during the Samnite Wars from 343 BC to 290 BC. At that time, the Romans too fought in a formation similar to the Greek phalanx. When fighting against the hill-dwelling Samnite tribes, they had realized that their tactics were ill-suited against mobile enemies fighting on sloping ground. Hence, they developed a new model, the Manipular Legion. The legion included 30 maniples, each formed by two centuries, each consisting of 60 to 80 soldiers plus auxiliaries. The maniples were deployed in three lines, following a much looser formation than the compact phalanx. In the first line for the Hastati, young, energetic, yet inexperienced soldiers. In second line came the Principes, still young and strong but more experienced. Lastly, for the Triari, the hardened veterans. These three lines of maniples were not deployed as long, cohesive ranks. Rather, these blocks of legionnaires were arranged in a checkerboard fashion, as the gaps in between allowed for fast advances and retreats to suit the tactical needs of the moment. The formation also allowed each maniple to wheel around with ease, thus dealing effectively with flanking maneuvers. Their armament was also conceived for maximum mobility. The Astarte and Princeps wielded two javelins each, which they flung at the enemy upon making contact. Then they unshared sheathed their fearsome primary weapon, the Gladius, a short sword optimal for thrusting attacks. The Triari, the last line of defense, fought mainly with an 8-foot or 2.5-meter spear. The Manipular Legion was completed with the presence of the Velites, light infantry, and the Equites, the cavalry. Both units acted as scouts, skirmishers, and more importantly, protected the flanks of the checkerboard. Achinocephaly, Flaminius could field 22,000 Roman legionnaires plus 6,400 Aetolian allies and 20 elephants. A mighty host, no doubt, but could they withstand the physical and psychological shock of a well-drilled, well-armed Macedonian phalanx. Just before dawn, a thick fog descended upon the ground. In the words of historian Polybius, so that no one could make out a man in front of one in the gloom. Due to such poor visibility, Philip sent his scouts on top of the nearby Kinocephaly Hill. Unbeknownst to him, on the other side of the ridge, Flaminius had had the same idea. By total chance, 300 cavalry and 1,000 light infantry units, probably Aetolians, encountered a similar Macedonian force on top of the hill. We can only imagine their surprise as enemy soldiers burst unexpectedly out of the shrouded silent dawn. Dismay turned into fear, and fear into rage as a skirmish broke out on top of the hill. The Aetolian units are outnumbered and were being pushed back down the slope of the hill. They sent a request for help to their main camp, and Flaminius reacted with speed, sending 500 horsemen and 2,000 footmen up the hill. This time, the Macedonians found themselves on the losing side, and they retreated towards the hilltop and asked Philip for reinforcements. Philip was taken by surprise, as he did not expect the enemy to be so close and in such numbers. The problem was the king had sent foraging most of his phalangites, but he still had other troops at his disposal. Philip ordered for part of his cavalry and his 
mercenaries to rush up the hill and give a sound beating to the Romans and the Aetolians, which they did. According to Polybius, at this stage the Romans were not completely routed, only thanks to their allies. Quote, what mainly prevented them from routing the enemy completely was the spirit of the Aetolian cavalrymen, for they fought quite passionately and recklessly. The passion of the Greek horsemen partially held back the Macedonian onslaught, and the Roman light infantry held firm on the lower part of the hill slope. And let us clarify two points here. The gradient of the Dog's Head Hill was not exceedingly steep, which allowed for cavalry action. Nonetheless, the Romans uh, were fighting a literal uphill battle, which put them at an instant disadvantage. This was not lost on Flaminius. As the fog lifted, he took notice of the fighting taking place on the slope, and he saw how his light forces were almost at breaking point. He then turned to the bulk of his men, still encamped, and ordered his officers to take formation and approach the hill. As the legionnaires took their position, Flaminius realized it was epic speech time, and he addressed his men. You've fought these men before, and you've beaten them before. These are are the same men you fought at house, dug into an impregnable position. You beat them in spite of the terrain. So why should there be any different here, where the ground is so much better? I'm confident this will be over quickly, and you should be too. Soon the Roman army was deployed according to the three lines we described before. Flaminius then ordered the right wing of the formation to stand firm, with the elephants in front. Then he took command of the left wing and led them into the melee. Thus far, the Roman and allied light infantry had been suffering against Philip's mercenaries, but when the first line of Hastati joined the fight, the scales were turned. Many mercenaries and Macedonian cavalry were slain, and the survivors started fleeing uphill. Meanwhile, on the other side of the ridge, Philip had been receiving encouraging news from his messengers. The barbarians will not stand up to us. Now is your day. Now your moment. Philip was not convinced. The terrain was not ideal for his prized phalanx, and many of his phalangites had not returned from their shopping run yet. But eventually he decided to go for an all-out battle. The king ordered his general, Nicanor, to assemble the straggling soldiers into the left wing of the formation. He then took command of the right wing of the phalanx and immediately marched uphill. When Philip reached the crest of the key Nicephaly, he noticed that the Roman heavy infantry had already assembled and had defeated his mercenary vanguard. He took stock of the situation. Nicanor's left wing was yet to assemble, his own right wing was stronger, but many of his phalangites were still climbing up the dog's head. Regardless, Philip decided to attack. He ordered the phalanx to double the length of their ranks to increase the shock power of the formation, and then came the order to charge. The massed troops lowered their awe-inspiring pikes and descended along the slope in a fast march. The Macedonian war machine was in motion, but the Romans would not retreat. Flaminius steadied the maniples on the left side of his formation and prepared for impact. And what an impact it must have been. Tons of hardened bone and muscle, bronze shields, wooden shafts, propelled by a downhill march, conveyed their kinetic energy into hundreds of deadly metal spikes, which pierced through the Romans' shields, their armor, and eventually their flesh. Naturally, the legionnaires were pushed back by the armored monster they were facing. Flaminius realized that the only hope lay with the right wing of his forces yet to be engaged, and he rushed to them. The consul realized that the Macedonian left had not adopted a steady formation yet. Its vanguard had almost made contact with his right wing. Another third of the forces were still descending from the hill's crest, and the final part was still standing on the heights. This is what Philip had feared. The hilly terrain had prevented half of his army from forming a proper phalanx, and Whatever little hope they had of assembling, it would soon be quashed by Flaminus's next tactic, an elephant charge. That's right, the Roman right wing charged uphill, preceded by 20 stampeding elephants who terrified and scattered the Macedonian forces. At this point, Polybius tells us most of the Romans were in pursuit, killing them. To recap, the battlefield at Cynocephaly could be roughly split into two halves. On one side, the Roman maniples and elephants were routing and massacring the Macedonians. On the other side, the Macedonian phalangites were steadily skewering their foes. So far, the battle was a tie, but an impromptu tactical decision would soon tip the scales. 
Polybius mentions that a military tribune in the right wing noticed that his companions in the left wing were being slaughtered. The name of this tribune was not preserved in history, but he can be considered as the true hero of the battle. Bellowing above the din of the battle, he rallied to his side some 20 maniples. Then he had them break off from the victorious Roman right wing and ordered them to rush to the help of the left wing. The legionnaires followed their tribune, traversed the battlefield, and fell upon Philip's phalanx, attacking from the rear. This was a phalanx and Giant's worst nightmare. Packed in a tight formation and brandishing heavy equipment, the infantrymen simply could not spin around and were massacred by the darting gladiuses. The maniples standing in front of the phalanx, who had been on the back foot until then, resumed the fight with renewed ferocity. The armored, bristling monster was being crushed in a perfect pincer movement. Philip realized this, and he tried to disengage. He collected as many soldiers as he could, and he fled uphill. Meanwhile, on the hill's crest, Flaminius was getting rid of the remaining resistance from Nicanor's left wing. Polybius describes how the Macedonian phalangites eventually held their pikes upright, a well-established sign of surrender. A sign which Flaminus apparently understood, but his men didn't or chose to ignore. The legionaries fell upon the surrendering soldiers, slaughtering them on the spot. Both sides of Philip's army had been thoroughly routed, beaten back beyond the ridge of Cynocephaly. According to Polybius, on that day, the Romans and their allies lost 700 soldiers. The Macedonians and their allies suffered 8,000 killed in action and 5,000 prisoners. Philip had lost half of his army, and he eventually sued for peace. The Second Macedonian War formally ended in spring of 196 BC with the ratification of a peace treaty. The clauses had left Philip's kingdom intact, but demanded for Philip to pay a hefty tribute and disband most of his armed forces. More importantly, it forced Philip to abandon his conquests and to demand permission from the Roman Senate if he wanted to conduct campaigns outside his borders. With the battle at Cynocephaly, the Roman Republic had effectively removed a dangerous rival and set the foundations for their expansion in Greece. And the eastern mediterranean so let's go back to the initial question who would win in a fight a phalanx or a legion the battle of cynocephaly was the first decisive victory of a manipular legion against a hellenistic phalanx and more would follow in future wars does this mean that a maniple is intrinsically superior to a phalanx the already quoted ngl hammond argues that the entire battle at dog's head was a close run affair as the phalanx on philips's right was effectively dealing with flaminius's initial formation the roman victory was decided by the improvised action of the unnamed tribune we would argue however that the tribune's flanking attack was made possible Possible by the very nature of the manipular legion which allowed for adaptability speed of reaction and maneuverability moreover the actions on the other side of the battlefield proved that without proper cohesion the macedonians were helpless against the romans even if they had the higher grounds so to give our own opinion a phalanx could be superior to a legion only if the phalandrides had the time to take up a proper formation and if their flanks were protected by more mobile troops let us know what you think in the comments and don't forget to mention future ancient battles that you'd like us to cover and while you're at it let us know your take in the comments below and thanks for watching